So I run a planetarium, and the planetarium is the Emil Bueller Planetarium at Seminole State College. And what I do basically is educate people about the universe. I take them on an immersive journey through the cosmos, um, all the way from the beginnings of the universe to now, and we travel you know, the lengths of the solar system and beyond, and just open up people's eyes to the scale and majesty of the universe. So the Big Bang is kind of a misnomer. It wasn't like a bang. It wasn't like boom and the universe exploded. It, the bang in a way is just this rapid development in the universe. So essentially at the very dawn of our universe, there was this very, very dense ball of, of mass and energy. Um, and over time it cooled and rapidly expanded. And from that, all the subatomic particles, all the things that build up matter, occurred during that time until about 200,000 years after that event, the first atoms start to come together. The electrons meet with the protons and eventually you give way to the rise of hydrogen, the most basic element in the universe. And from there, the emergence of light, photons start to appear. And now we're able to detect those using telescopes and, and uh, other uh, detectors. Well, th so th that's the thing about when you get to the very beginnings of the universe, um, it starts to get a little bit more muddy because of the fact that as an astronomer, we can only really see the beginnings of the universe through light. And if you ever seen white noise, some of our some of us are not old enough to know what white noise is, but you know when you turn on the radio or you look at a TV station. It, you'll get that white noise. And that white noise is the background radiation from the very first you know, atoms in the universe. And we see it's uniform throughout the universe. So at some point, all of that had to come from, from somewhere. And it's uniform, which means that it rapidly expanded very quickly from a singular source, which is where we basically have this hypothesis that it had to occur from this, what we call singularity. Now, when you get to that we can date that based on light light modeling and, and, and computational mathematics. We can date that occurring around 200,000 years from the very first, uh, the beginnings of the universe. And we can then go from there based on the velocities of this and all the other stuff. But once we go past that, that time into ancient time, we have to do other types of science like particle physics, you know, using like the large hydrogen collider and things like that, modeling, simulating what the early universe was like. And then we can start to kind of fit those puzzles of what that singularity might have been or what, how do subatomic particles actually form and, and things of that nature. Um, but there's still a lot of pieces of that puzzle we still don't really know. And that's the thing about science is, you know, we don't know all the answers yet, but we're, but we're using the scientific method. We're using things that we can model, we can, we, can, we can observe to answer those questions for us. So one of the coolest things that I like to see through a telescope is actually kind of silly for somebody who, like me who likes, looks at galaxies, but honestly, just looking at things as simple as the planets it just blows your mind. The fact that when you look at Mars through a telescope, you can actually see the, uh, the large valleys and mountain ranges and the basins, and just imagining that that's a planet, that's another planet that you know we can go explore as humans at some point in the future. Um, but when it comes to things that are very far away, the thing that blows my mind is when you look at, uh, there's an area of the sky um, where it's kind of in the springtime, um, here in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say, um, where there are, you look through a telescope and there are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 galaxies in just a single view through the telescope. And the thing that blows my mind is that each one of those galaxies is like a spiral galaxy, like our own Milky Way. And that one of those galaxies may contain hundreds of billions of stars. And just imagine yourself, you know, each of these galaxies may have planets that are like Earth. And it just, it, the, the imagination runs wild after that. So flat Earth has been around a lot longer than some people claim to be. Um, I was actually talking about flat Earth for over 20 years. 
Um, and it really kind of escalated with the rise of social media and YouTube and, and those kind of things because of the accessibility. But Flat Earth has been around. It actually, ironically, kind of started off as not really satire, but not really taken super seriously, and then started escalating into something more serious. But it's it's it, it comes from that same thing, you know, the fact that you can easily go to a, a, a place and and uh, especially all across the ocean, uh, you can see the curvature of the Earth because you can see boats coming across. You can, I mean, there's so many things that. You know, I heard people say the moon's a projection and the stars are projection and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, if you look at the moon, you can actually see the moon kind of what we call libration, basically wobbles. And I'm like, how is that a projection? Now we can actually see the curvature of the moon, the shadows of the moon during the wobbling effect as it goes around the Earth over its 27 day per orbital period. I mean, you know, if it's a projection, it's not flat. People don't realize that the moon's not just a flat. It's just that from our point of view, we don't have the magnification for it. But through a telescope, you can see the shadows change and all these different things that you wouldn't see otherwise. But that's the thing that blows my mind about it, is that we have all the tools necessary to understand these things, yet people still decide to believe these crazy ideas. And, uh, you know, flat earth is one of those things that I think that majority of the people I talk to a lot of people in my my type of work and most people don't think the earth is flat but there are unfortunately a few people and unfortunately that small minority has a big voice and it comes out and then you, you know the people that have maybe just a ink, small amount of information to go with might tip over to that side but most of the people I talk to are, are thankfully are very at least knowledgeable enough to know the earth is not flat so I feel I can sleep better at night knowing that that at least is not as much of an issue as some other things. When it comes to the media portraying the cosmos and the scientific accuracy of that, that runs the gamut on, on it. So movies like Interstellar bringing consultants that actually want work with the, the people producing the content and try to be true to the science. And I commend that. And actually, you know, as I'm also a creative person too. When I come, when the planetarium, I design shows, I create stuff, I, I, I work with the, with, with our theater department. And I know that there, that sometimes scientific stuff doesn't translate well to an artistic form. But movies like Interstellar do a really great job at portraying science as well as they can. And of course, other movies, um, you know, uh, like, you know, Armageddon, for example. I actually walked out of the theater because I was pretty embarrassed by how horrible the science was. Explaining that there was an asteroid the size of Texas coming down, and I'm like, there's no asteroids, you know, that are you know, that they're gonna, you know, that we would see that much further away. We wouldn't be surprised by it, you know. And just blowing up an asteroid, horrible idea. Uh, the way they portrayed, you know, the spaceships and all that stuff. It was just, you know, so I think it, you know, I think that there's a level of passion that people have, like, you know, Apollo 13 was another one that was done well, you know, because it wanted to really home in on the idea of what it was like to travel through space with those astronauts. So there are movies that do a great job, and then there are movies that just, I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> Not so good. So one of the things that I, I'm doing with the planetarium too is that we have telescopes and one of the things that you know a lot of kids today are attached to are digital devices. And what's cool about a lot of the technology that now is accessible to consumers, to amateur astronomers and the like, is we can take cameras, attach them to telescopes, transmit those pictures to an iPad or something of that nature and these kids just light up when they see it. They actually captured a galaxy with a telescope and that to me is what I'm excited about, working with kids and actually getting them attached to a telescope, having them point the telescope to an object and then having them collect that data using an iPad. And those kids just lose it and then I start asking, what's going on, why does it look like this? And it just opens up this excitement that, um, you know, instead of fighting fire with fire, you know, let's fight with the idea that, you know, these kids are attached, they're, they're, they've grown since they were little kids, you know, being attached to technology and digital, 
let's take the real world and, com and also the digital and combine them together with these kind of things. And I'm finding that less and less kids really care about looking through a telescope unless it's like the moon. But doing it this way, this is gonna really inspire the next generation. Plus also the thing is, you know, what we did as kids when we looked through a telescope are gonna be different than what the kids are gonna look at now. There, there's, there's questions like, how's gravity work? Is gravity a, a way that we can understand the origins of the universe? There are things that light cannot explain about the universe. And these kids are gonna be the ones that are gonna be looking, building telescopes that will be able to detect gravitational waves and things that will help us explain to the very, one of the earliest questions you gave me was how do we know the, the beginnings of the universe? And I think that's gonna become much more clear as we start diving into these new technologies that uh, especially these young kids now are gonna become the next generation that are gonna operate.